23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The second reading comes from the first Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. The final reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 24 through 25. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I started uh, working on this message several weeks ago with World Communion Sunday in mind and with the idea of, of some application to uh, our denominational uh, issues that are going on in the United Methodist Church. But in light of the events of recent weeks in our nation, I figure we may as well just throw the nation in there too because the question is relevant on both sides. Do we even still need the word united as a part of the title of our country or as a part of the title of our denomination? Could we not just be the various states of America? And would that not be a more accurate description of who we are today? Could we not just be the Methodist Church or some other version of the Methodist Church and stop with the pretense about all this being some kind of union that is striving to be more perfect, some kind of church that is striving to show the unity of the body of Christ? Could we not just remove that title altogether? I mean, when, when I ask that question, I know there's some people going, sure, <laughs> we may as well, because we are now so polarized in so many ways that it's, it's us versus them. It's good versus evil. It's not people with differing ideologies and ideas about how to go about things and, and beliefs that we're drawing conclusions about, that we've drawn as conclusions, but it is now, I'm righteous, they're unrighteous, why would I want to be united with somebody like that? It would be a supreme compromise of my faith, a lot of people are thinking, to even raise the question of unity. Does it have any relevance at all? I want to share uh, some, some biblical instruction from these scriptures that we read today for us to ponder. Beginning with Jesus' prayer for unity. In chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, the setting is like today. It's a communion setting. It's the Last Supper. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. Pretty soon he's going to be physically removed. And he's getting them ready you know, to be courageous, to take comfort. I'm going to give you the comforter, the Holy Spirit in my place. Uh, he's teaching them and instructing them, preparing them. And as a part of that preparation, he's praying for them. And this is part of his pretty long prayer for his disciples, his apostles, just these 12 or maybe 11 now if Judas has left the scene. <clears throat> but he's praying for their unity. The unity of men who had great natural rivalries. You had a, a zealot, you had a tax collector representing opposite sides of, of, of the fence. You had people who naturally competed with each other. Remember the story of when James and John go and say, can I sit one at your right? Can we sit one at your right and one at your left in your glory when you come in your glory? And it says that the others were indignant. They were indignant at James and John for the audacity of making such a request. So these are, these are people that left alone, it could, it could go the wrong way. And so Jesus is praying for their unity. My prayer, he says, is that all of them may be one that they may be one as we are one. Twice now he pr prays for their unity. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. It's like underscore unity, underscore oneness. Not just one, but complete unity because then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. 
there's a, there's a practical reason for Jesus praying for their unity. It pertains to the effectiveness of their witness in the world, to their dissemination of the gospel. He knows if they all go their own way, if they go as divided uh, apostles as, and missionaries, if they go all, each with their own agenda and their own idea of what the church ought to be, it's not going to work. Their unity is essential to the ongoing witness of Christ, for Christ and dissemination of his gospel in the world. If they're unified, it will validate their witness. If they're divided, their witness will be compromised. Here's the great irony. We feel that conversation about unity somehow involves compromising my fundamental beliefs. When the exact opposite is true. When we refuse a conversation about unity, we are compromising our witness for Christ in the world. And there is this idea, however you spin it, that at some point, lesser differences have to give way to greater goods. That's the spirit of team. I played high school football with two guys that hated each other because they had the same girlfriend, or they both wanted the same girl as their girlfriend. And they were rivals. They played the same position on, on the football field on either side of the ball. But they had the ability between fights at practice and calling each other names all the time, that, that when a game was being played, they could, they could set that aside, and for the good of the team, they could play for the good of the team and make a contribution. And that's kind of the idea that I hear Jesus praying for, praying for, for his apostles. The, the counter of that is this. There is not only prayer for unity, there is warning against division. There's a warning of the risk you are taking when you persist in division, whether that is as a nation, as a city, Matthew brings in the word city in his version of it, or as a family. Do we not know that division in families is not a good thing? We know that it hurts families. We know that there is pain associated with that. Jesus said every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. I think Jesus was quoting a popular saying of the day when he, when he said this. If you read the context of it, he's talking about, he's responding to a criticism that he's casting out by the power, demons by the power of Satan. And they criticize and they say, he's only able to do this through the power of Satan. And he's trying to illustrate, this would be pitting Satan against Satan. And Satan would, would crumble if that were the case. It's not evil working with evil, it is, or working against evil, it is good working against evil. And so he quotes this, this well-known quote, every kingdom divided against itself will not stand, as an illustration of what he's trying to talk about. But the illustration is more pervasive than just tied to that particular context, if that makes sense. But it's a dire warning that division leads to destruction. Paul says the same thing in Corinthians. The Corinthian church, if you know anything about it, was his most problematic church. I mean, this was a church where there were a lot of gifted people, uh, very spiritually gifted people, but very immature in their faith at the same time. And part of that immaturity was expressed through selfishness and self-centered preoccupation. You know, that they would gather for communion in, in the Corinthian church when he talks about it in chapters 10 and 11. And the way communion worked in those early days of the church is that people would actually come together in the early evening for a meal. And Holy Communion would be celebrated in the context of the meal. Well, what was apparently happening was that people who could afford to go ahead and get off work early were coming in early, while the blue-collar crowd that working by the hour had to work the full day. So the white-collar crowd would come in, they'd go ahead and start eating. And they'd go ahead and start drinking the wine, which was not Welch's. It was alcoholic wine. So they were getting drunk. So by the time the blue collar crowd got to the dinner, all the potluck food was gone and all the wine was gone. And everybody was drunk and it was just chaotic. And you know how we, we talk about taking the communion in a worthy manner, not taking it in an unworthy manner? That's what Paul's talking about there. He's not talking about, oh, I lost my temper and said a, a cuss word this week. He's talking about you are blaspheming the sacredness of, of this meal in the way you're behaving toward one another, just looking out for your own good. And so he says at the outset of 1 Corinthians, I appeal in the name of Christ that you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you. 
I appeal that there be no divisions among you. Why? Because that's a bad thing. But that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. Echoing Jesus' prayer at the Last Supper recorded in John 17. So here's the conclusion. Scripture teaches us that unity is a good thing and division is a dangerous thing. When we choose division over unity, we are going against the clear prayer and teaching and warning of our Lord. When we reject unity in the name of purity, we are compromising more than we realize, and we are jeopardizing the body of Christ, and we are jeopardizing our nation. So here are considerations moving forward. This this is my pastoral advice, that we be guided by the GC. Now, some of you who are familiar with the Methodist debate understand that GC means General Conference. General Conference is coming up in February of 2019. Delegates from across the world will gather to consider the matter of human sexuality and all the various models and petitions and proposals that are coming before the the General Conference. And we're anxiously awaiting the outcome of General Conference to see what we're going to do, see which way it goes. Here's what I want to suggest. GC doesn't stand for that. GC stands for Great Commandment, which says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. When we're committed to love, it softens things. It it softens the dialogue or the debate. You know, I'm a graduate of the University of Kentucky, and most of you know that because I talk about it a lot uh, in the course of a year. We started the football season 5-0, and played Texas A&M last night. And, uh, okay, give me a whoops. I, I, I wore my maroon in honor of, of Texas A&M. My son and grandson, who are at this, at this service, were at the game last night. And I was getting all kinds of texts back and forth from them. You want to bet on the game, Grandpa? You want to, uh, well, then you said, no, I don't think I want to, after we picked up that fumble and ran it in for a score. You're kind of changing your mind on that. But so, really, I, I, I watched the first half with some Aggie friends of ours. And this is the honest truth. It softens the way I watch a ball game when I'm with people I love. When people I love are Aggies, because my son went to A&M. See, he defected and then he's raising up an Aggie. I can't get to the young man as much as my son can, so I've kind of conceded that. So I got an Aggie son, an emerging Aggie grandson. I'm dyed in the wool Kentucky blue. And, but the way I normally watch a game, you wouldn't want to be around, you know, because it is losing my temper. It is like they stink, the questioning the coaching, turn the TV off, come and check on the game later, just going, going into a pout going to bed on Saturday night upset, you know, win or lose, I, I go to bed upset, but, but it softened it. It honestly did because I love my son and grandson. I love the friends I was watching the game with. I was more mindful of my behavior. I'm actually glad K- Kentucky lost because I didn't want to have to console my grandson and son all this week and say, it's all right, guys, life will go on, you'll get over it, and, and it'll all be good. When there's love involved... It softens things in a good way. That make us weak, it softens things in a good way. Listen with an open mind. Listen with an open mind. Listening has pretty much disappeared from the landscape. Would you not agree listening to the other side, especially when it's different than, than yours? But to listen with an open mind and, and to speak with respect when you, resp- when you speak to others who are opponents, not enemies. Who are opponents, not enemies. It's called Holy Conversations, and there's been a book written by that title, and it has to do with that that whole idea of Covey saying, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Take time to listen to what the other person has to say, to hear their story and honor their story and honor their beliefs. It's possible. It's possible. It doesn't all have to be reactive. It doesn't all have to be angry. Paul says in Colossians 3, be rid of anger. Be rid of malice. Set your hearts and minds on things above. This is a powerful chapter of Scripture. Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Set your hearts and minds on things above. Put to death whatever belongs to the earthly nature. Get rid of anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. 
Here there is no Republican or Democrat, no progressive or traditionalist. I'm reading into the text a little here, but you, you get the idea of it. But Christ is all and is in all. Bear with each other. Forgive one another. If you have a grievance against someone, and over all these put on love, which binds all together. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. I just think for every hour you watch Fox or CNN or whatever your news feed of choice is, go spend 15 or 20 minutes reading these verses from Colossians 3. Pray about them and, and see how that affects your mindset and your attitude toward the national and the denominational debates that are going on. Pray for one another. James advises that. And I recognize that when he says, pray for one another that you may be healed, that healing is not just about the body. It's about the, the, the heart, the emotions. It's a spiritual thing. It's a relational thing. We need relational healing in our land and in our church. Who will pray for that? Who will live toward that and act toward that? In essentials, unity. Wesley said, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, love. We come in Holy Communion to one table. One table. We could have put up two tables, and we could have said, Democrats over here, Republicans over here. Progressives come to this table, traditionalists come to this table. That way we can all keep to our kind and stay with people that agree with us. But Jesus gave us one table, one Lord, one baptism, one faith. That has pretty radical implications to me. Let us pray. Dear God, may we join you in your prayer for the unity of your church. May we see the importance of unity, not as a need to set aside things we feel strongly about, or pretend those things don't exist, but to understand that there are higher goods and there are lesser goods. And for the sake of the higher good, of not only the great commandment, but the great commission to make disciples of Jesus Christ in the world, we'd be willing to, uh, to live with some differences and to set some differences aside while we achieve the goal of making disciples and of being a unified witness of Jesus Christ in this world. We pray for healing in our nation. We pray for healing in our church. We pray for healing in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. So therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please take a moment of silent reflection. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to, God. to God. Amen. There is one bread because there is one body that was broken for us all. Wherever we come from, whatever we look like, whatever our pre present or past may be, there's one bread to which we are all called to share. It's the body of Christ that was broken for us. And we recall how on that night that he was betrayed, he took it, blessed it, and gave thanks. He said, this is my body, 
which is broken for you, for all of you. As often as you eat this bread, do so in memory of me. One cup of blessing, one cup, one person whose blood was shed, that is Jesus's. After the supper, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this cup, do so in memory of me. For those who are serving communion, please come at this time. As they come, please know that we have gluten-free bread. If you would need to be served in that way, just indicate to me, and I'll offer you the gluten-free bread and cup. All are invited to come and share Holy Communion. We do it by intention, which means we come to the front. Uh, a steward will give you a piece of bread, and then you'll just dip the bread lightly in the cup held by the steward next to that one and receive Holy Communion in that way. I'm going to put the offering trays on either end. Uh, any offering that you give to the basket will go to the church's ministry. Any offering that you place in the trays will go for Hurricane Florence flood relief and, and, and the devastation that happened in the Carolinas through the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Come to the table. I have come with one purpose to capture for myself a bride. By my life she is lovely, by my death she's justified. I have always been her husband, though many lovers she has known. So with water I will wash her, oh, and by my word alone. So when you hear the sound of the water, you will not alone cause I haven't come for only you but for my people to pursue you cannot care for me with no regard for her if you love me, you will love the church. Oh, and long I have pursued her, though she broke the vows she swore. 
Oh, but she will feast upon me. She will drink and thirst no more. So when you taste my flesh and my blood, you will know you're not alone. Cause I haven't come for only you, but for my people to pursue. You cannot care for me with no regard for her. If you love me, you will love the church. There is none that can replace her. Though there are many who will try And though some may be her bridesmaids They can never be my bride Cause I haven't come for only you But for my people to pursue You cannot care for me With no regard for her If you love me you will love the church if you love me, you will love the church. Thank you, Abel. Well, this is a beautiful World Communion table display. The credit technically goes to Abel, our traditional worship leader, but actually it goes to Abel's wife, Lupina Stewart, who's an associate pastor in our church, who he's reminded me today, she did this, and thank you, Lupina, and thank you, Abel, for a beautiful setting to remind us. We come from many places, we're all very different, but we're one body in Christ. So let us pray. Dear God, make us one in Jesus Christ. Help us to understand what's at stake in our national debates, and in our denominational debates. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song together. One bread, one body, one Lord of all, one cup of blessing which we bless, and we, though many, throughout the earth, we We are.
Let's join our hands together as we symbolize unity to go to be God's people in God's world in this coming week. Well, God, you are one Lord, and we, though many and though very different, are one body.